Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Eunice Emery Institute London and Leighton House, a very, very warm welcome to everyone joining us this evening. Uh, we're very excited. This is the first in our series of artist-led talks exploring the arts and crafts of Turkey, and it continues our long-standing uh, collaboration, which brings um, much pleasure to us all. Um, we are really thrilled uh, to welcome celebrated artist Nuria Garcia Massip this evening, and she will be sharing her practice as an award-winning calligrapher with us. Um, if you have any questions, do share them in the Q&A panel and the chat. Um, we will have time later on this evening for Nuria to respond. Um, so thank you, Nuria. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. I would like to thank very much um, the Yunus Emre Institute for organizing this event and the Leeton House Museum for hosting this series. It's really a, a real pleasure to participate. Um, so I would like to start by saying that art often starts with a journey. And we can see this in the beautiful home and art of Frederick Leeton, which is now the Leeton House Museum in London. Um, and in my own case, my own path uh, also started with a journey. Um, I would like to show with you today uh, some slides of, of um, my, my path in calligraphy. And I will finish also with some of my, my work. And then hopefully we will move on to questions and so on. So let me just share the, the screen. Um, sorry. Bear with me. All right, so my journey started um, in the Fez Medina uh, in 1999. <laughs> so I had actually grown up between Spain and the US and I had studied at the George Washington University with a very celebrated and wonderful professor, Dr. Said Hussein Nasser, who is a, a world uh, authority on Islamic art and thought. And he encouraged me to explore a path in traditional Islamic art, which I didn't know uh, was even possible at the time. So after finishing my university studies, I traveled to Fez in theory to study Arabic, but actually I ended up spending all of my time in the Medina exploring different arts and crafts from, uh, with a traditional craftsman. So I did uh, soko carving. This is uh, a picture of myself uh, working on a, on a uh, jibs panel. I did geometry. Um, I would walk around the Medina and copy the inscriptions. I saw the Kufic ones, which were easier. And so I was immediately attracted uh, to calligraphy in this way, even though at the time I knew very little about it. Um, I, I also did the liege, the, the traditional Moroccan mosaics. You see a small tile here below, which is my work uh, carving it. Um, and I also met a self-taught calligrapher who, who worked at the Medina making signs and so on. And it, it, it in, in immediately drew me. I, I love the simplicity of it. I love the ink, the paper, the kalam, uh, and how it was, um, a moment of solitude when I was practicing calligraphy, but I knew that I needed a real teacher. So um, I started to investigate and I knew about uh, a great master who was actually in the US, Mohammed Zakaria, who had received uh, his ijaza, which is the calligraphy diploma from Hassan Chalebi. Hassan Chalebi is one of the greatest living uh, calligraphy masters in Turkey. And he had given a jaza to this 100% um, American uh, artist, Mohamed Zekiria, who was living in Washington. He's still living in Washington and teaching. So I moved 
I went back to Washington. I asked to be his student and very graciously he accepted me. He made me go to the Library of Congress and read for three months before <laughs> going to, to his uh, studio. And then after, um, after those initial months, we started regular classes. So the regular, uh, Mohammed Sekiria is, is a great exponent of the Ottoman school of calligraphy, which is the Turkish school of calligraphy based on a very, very precise curriculum. And I'm not going to go into the details of the curriculum. I mean, that's the topic of another talk, but I would like to show you um, just a little bit of, of what a calligraphy student does and um, what my first steps in, in this journey were. So um, this is actually a, a very nice picture of what a typical class uh, looks like, meaning the teacher is writing and correcting lessons and all the students are just looking and observing his every move. Here uh, we have an example. On the top left is one of the first lessons that he wrote for me in the Thuluth and Nesich styles of calligraphy. Now, there are many styles of calligraphy. Um, I had done a very simple style before with him for a few months, and but the styles I was I was actually interested in were these ones, which are the more artistic ones, the Thuluth, which we see also in the Leeton House Museum and the beautiful tiles of the Arab Room, and Nesik, which is the smaller sister script and is written for longer texts and so on, and the tradition. Uh, in the Ottoman school is that you start not with the letters of the alphabet, and I'm not sure if, um, for those of you who can read Arabic, um, the top line is actually a prayer, Rabbi Yasser Walato Asir. And in the bottom part, we have the individual letters of the alphabet. So this prayer, um, Sometimes it's given individually, and the students will write it at minimum for 40 days, sometimes for years. Hassan Chelebi himself, the great master, had to write it for two years when he was a student of Hamid Aitaj. Um, but Mohammed Sekiria, for some reason, decided to give me all of this at once <laughs> in one page. And as you can see in the bottom part of the slide, uh, you see all the red corrections of um, the feedback that the, the teacher gives a student, which is always a moment of great joy because when you receive the red corrections, it means that the teacher is actually giving you his time. And so red corrections, I always tell my students, are actually um, really a, a source of great happiness for the student because that is where you start understanding where you've gone wrong and how you can improve. So after, um, some some years with two years with Mohammed Zekeria, um, I had to interrupt my studies with him and go back to Morocco for some family reasons. And there I um, met Hamidi uh, Belaid, who is also a great great calligrapher who had also studied with Hassan Chelebi from Istanbul. And so Mohammed Zekeria told me, "Do not uh, do." Thuluth and Nesih with them because you are with me and you should not mix teachers when you're doing um, a style. However, you should study Maghrebi with them. And so that's what I did. I did one year of Maghrebi with Hamid Bel Aid in Rabat, which was a beautiful experience and very close to my heart because as you know, um, I'm originally from Spain and in Spain we have the Andalusian style, which is very, very close to the Maghrebi. And um, however, the long distance lessons were very complicated. I couldn't go back to the US. And a friend uh, who had studied with Mohammed Sekeria and who was Turkish originally, Dennis Oktam, she had gone back to Istanbul and she said, Nuria, really, you should be in Istanbul. You're really wasting your time in Morocco, <laughs> this and that. You really should come to Istanbul. This is where the source is. This is where all the masters are and you will greatly benefit from, from being here. So thanks to this very valuable advice, I decided to move to Istanbul. And I asked, um, I asked through, the, through Dennis Oktem, 
I asked Hassan Chalevi if I could be his student and Hassan Chalevi said he wasn't teaching at the time. He wasn't accepting new students. So I had basically planned everything to go to Istanbul. So I had to go anyway. Um, here, I'm showing you the slide because you can see really how it is the cradle of Ottoman calligraphy, calligraphy, which is one of the last schools to develop in the history of calligraphy. We have many schools throughout history that were great contributors to this art. However, because the Ottoman school um, comes later and it's more recent, that is why it's still very much a living tradition. And you see here the very beautiful um, inscriptions of Aya Sofia. I've put a very beautiful piece by Sheikh Hamdullah, who is the founding father of the Ottoman school of calligraphy from the uh, 15th century. And another very beautiful uh, piece by Sami Effendi, who was also one of the great masters of this school. So, um, so thanks again uh, to this friend, Dennis Oktem, who's also a calligrapher now. Um, she suggested, and Hassan Chelebi suggested as well, that I study with um, a younger master at the time, uh, the great Dawud Bektash, who is really um, a wonderful, wonderful master calligrapher, also with his ijaza from Hassan Chelebi. So as you can see, um, it's very important in calligraphy. You, when you're studying calligraphy, you become part of a family of calligraphers. And all these calligraphers are connected by a chain of transmission, um, which goes back for centuries. So it was very important for me to, to respect this chain of transmission and to respect this um, link that existed be between Mohammed Zekeria, his teacher, Hassan Chalevi, and then Hassan Chalevi student, Tawad Bektash. So um, another unexpected thing that happened when I arrived to Istanbul, obviously I didn't know Turkish. So I started taking Turkish classes, intensive classes, so I could communicate uh, with my teachers. And I would go um, to Suleymaniye. This is an aerial view of the beautiful mosque of Suleymaniye, um, where Daud Hoja, and when I use the term Hoja, for those of you who don't know Turkish, it means Ustad or teacher, master. So um, Daud Hoja also decided he wasn't going to teach that first year. <laughs> so I had basically moved my whole life around to be in Istanbul. Hassan Chalevi says he's not accepting students. Daud Hoja said, I'm giving a break with classes. <laughs> but then uh, very graciously, he said, look, since you're here, um, I have a class with Master Ali Al Parslan, who is here in this picture, uh, Rahim Akhula. He passed away a few years later. And I'm studying this, the, another style, Talik, with him. So on my way to see Ali Al Parslan, um, you can stand near the mosque and we will pick a bench and I will check your lesson. So that's basically what I did for one year. I would go there on the Friday and intercept him on his way to Ali al and he would sit with me, he would correct my lesson, and then he would go on to visit his teacher. So that was a very uh, wonderful period for me, but very solitary. So I was just working, working, work, doing Turkish, studying calligraphy, seeing Daud Hoja once a week, and I would just go home. And also I would go and visit uh, Hassan Chalevi and his classes. Um, at that time, we didn't have smartphones. So this is why I actually have very few pictures because it was a time where selfies and documenting every moment of life wasn't really what we did. So, um, but nevertheless, I, I had some beautiful moments with Hassan Chalevi. He would basically supervise everything I was doing and also correct my lessons from time to time but the person who was actually in charge, so to speak, to check every single lesson and decide when I would pass to the next lesson and so on, was um, Daud Bektash. So uh, here I would like to show you the, the first lesson I did with him. He made me go back to the beginning again. I didn't have to start with Rabbi Yasser, but I did have to start with the letters of the alphabet. 
And here you see the corrections in red of the teacher, the precious corrections, which we keep and save um, with a lot of care. And the little line in red in the bottom is the line that the teacher marks when a student may pass to the next lesson. So um, after the individual letters, we start doing connections and you go through all the letters of the alphabet, connecting them. We call this the Mufredat. This is the example of my last lesson of the Mufredat where we had the connections of the letter Ha. And, um, and I'm very happy with this lesson because finally I passed, I had finished all the letter collections and connections. And you can see here the, the little aferin in red, which Daur Hoja wrote, meaning well done. It's like an encouragement. And then tamam tul huruf, sorry, tamatil huruf, the, the, the alphabet has been finished. And then you start with Alif Kasidesi, which is a very long poem um, in honor of the prophet, where every line starts with a letter of the alphabet. As I mentioned, I don't want to go into too much technical detail, but I just thought it would be nice for you to see a little bit of what the student of calligraphy does uh, during all these years of, of training. In the bottom, you see another style, the Nesir style, which is studied parallel, uh, side by side. And again, this was also the last lesson of the Mufredat uh, with the letter Ha. So the second year of my, my learning with Daud Bektash, finally he had resumed classes. And so that was very nice because we were able to see what the other students were doing. You learn so much from seeing the more advanced students, the less advanced students, it's like a constant review. And again, we didn't have smartphones, we didn't have cameras. We were just every second with the teacher, you, you don't write in front of the teacher, you're just observing his every move and really taking in every single moment that you have, uh, seeing the, the mastery of the pen. And as Mohammed Zakaria told me, one of the first things that, that he said to me, he said, in calligraphy, it really doesn't matter how much talent you have. Talent is 1%, 99% is patience and perseverance. perseverance. Um, and I think any, anyone who has tried doing calligraphy is, can agree <laughs> with this statement. Uh, so finally, after quite a few years, um, I arrived to Istanbul in 2004. So in the end of 2007, I received my ijaza. Now, the ijaza is um, the certificate which is given to the calligrapher, which basically means you have finished the curriculum. Um, you are now able to produce a piece of work and you are now able to teach and transmit this art. It doesn't mean that you are an amazing calligrapher, not at all. <laughs> it just means uh, you've gotten to a certain plateau and with the aid of God, it will not go down from there, but you can hopefully continue improving. And this is a very important point because um, basically in this picture, you see on the right, Hassan Chelebi, uh, then you see Daud Hocha in Daud Bektash in the middle, and then the three board members of Irsika, which is the research center for Islamic history, art and culture based in Istanbul. The center is linked to the Islamic conference in Jeddah. And, um, and they facilitate these uh, ijaza ceremonies, um, which uh, I remember at the time when I received my ijaza, uh, someone asked uh, Daur Hoja uh, why he had given it. And, and he basically said, uh, well, I just, I, I know every single letter that she does and I know that it's not going to get worse. <laughs> <laughs> meaning there's no chance of, you know, going down and you just try to keep that level and continue to improve. And I know also that from third parties that it was Hassan Hoja who actually suggested, he said, you, you really should give them the ijazah. I, I also received my ijazah with my friend Dennis Oktam. Um, and he said, you, you really should give it to them because it will give them a sort of baraka or a certain blessing. 
And, and it is true in the sense that the Ijaza, it's a huge responsibility, but it does give you a, a, cer a certain impetus to continue in the path of calligraphy. Um, so here's a, an example. Now for the Ijaza, what we actually do is we copy uh, an old piece of a great masterwork of calligraphy. We try to reproduce it in the most uh, exact way possible. And then um, when the teacher, we do this individually uh, at home. And then when the teacher thinks that you've arrived to a certain level, then he will sign um, the Ijaza, giving you authority to, to transmit and to teach. And here I was very blessed to have the signature of my three teachers. So Hassan Chalevi, Daud Mekdash, and Mohammed Zekeria. And this is a very unusual uh, photograph, which I never thought would happen, which is actually Daud Mekdash and Mohammed Zekeria together in Washington, DC, uh, looking at a, at a very beautiful reproduction that Mohammed Zekeria did of, of a, a treatise on calligraphy and this was taken in, in his studio in 2016 and it's very very beautiful to see the relationship that develops um, amongst calligraphers through the years it's a very deep uh, connection not at all personal it's actually based on just this deep love for calligraphy and you can see when calligraphers get together and there's calligraphy involved everything else just vanishes and disappears and they're just in complete heaven uh, looking <laughs> at these beautiful pieces of calligraphy and discussing about it. And as I mentioned earlier, the jazz is definitely not the end. So I continued, I, at that time I had left Istanbul, I was living in Germany, and I continue visiting Daud uh, Hoja for um, every, at the beginning it was every month and then every three months. Um, regularly and showing him all the pieces I was working on and so on. Now with time, it has spaced out. Now it's the first time I haven't been to Istanbul for a year um, because of the different circumstances, the coronavirus and so on. But um, it has been a, a, an extremely important part of my life. It still is. And and there's, a, there's that continuity, which is essential. As, as they say in calligraphy, you never stop learning and the journey continues until you die. And so the, the, this relationship with the teachers is, is a very profound and beautiful one. And it's actually um, very interesting to note that they come into our dreams in, in the world of calligraphy, we, there are three types of calligraphy exercise. One is um, what they call mashk amali in Persian, meaning it comes from Arabic, meaning the practice of calligraphy. So writing, 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 and repeating. Then you have the mashk nazari, which means the mashk of the eye. So it means looking at calligraphy. And that's one of the reasons why Istanbul is such a wonderful place to study because you have calligraphy everywhere. And then you have mashk uh, hayali, which means imagining calligraphy. Not imagining and literally, but thinking about calligraphy. And so when they would ask Hassan Chelevi students, typically they always say, Hoja, how many hours should I study every day in order to you know, be good in my mashk? And he would always laugh and say 36 hours a day, <laughs> meaning uh, the day doesn't have enough hours. I mean, you're basically either thinking about it dreaming about it or, or actually doing it. And, and these three aspects are, are really important. So one of the signs um, that you are, have entered, let's say the, <laughs> the, that you're really serious, let's say about learning calligraphy and that calligraphy is, is entering uh, slowly uh, into your being is uh, having dreams about calligraphy and seeing compositions in your dreams and seeing your teachers in your dreams. And there are beautiful stories of Ottoman calligraphers who sometimes when they couldn't solve a certain composition, they would dream with another master who would come and give them the solution, or they would actually dream with the solution to the composition in their dreams and they would wake up in the middle of the night and be sure to note it down. 
I, uh, I also had a, a lot of dreams uh, with Dawood Hoja. Sometimes just uh, him just smiling and that reassured me knowing that what, whatever I was doing in my mesh and my calligraphy was in the right direction. Sometimes I even had dreams where he was tearing my mesh <laughs> in the middle. And that also uh, was a sign that something was not, not right. So it's actually quite beautiful um, the way these things happen without really being uh, conscious of it. So um, here I wanted to uh, show a little bit of, of my work basically to show you what we do as calligraphers. I often, uh, I'm based in Paris and France and many times I, I realize people in the West don't really know what calligraphers do. They, they think calligraphers were copyists from the Middle Ages copying books and it's a little bit, um, or some of them think we do street art, you know, it really goes from one to the, one extreme to the other. And um, basically, as calligraphers today, we mainly work on a format called the levha, which is uh, a calligraphy panel, which is going to be hung up on the wall in order to be uh, contemplated. Not very much like the piece I have here behind. And amongst these levhas or these calligraphy pieces, we have um, many different genres. One of them, which is very popular and well-known is the hilia which is, it can be described as the calligraphic icon of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is actually one of the first hilias that I did and was properly illuminated by the wonderful artist Eda Funda. Um, calligraphers usually work on the calligraphy and then we have all these other uh, incredible artists, the illuminators who will take the piece and decorate it. And so it's finally a joint product. Mm -hmm. And um, the Hilia has a very specific symbolism. I won't go into it, but um, just so you know that the text that is inside um, contains the description of the physical attributes of the prophet as described by Sayyidina Ali. And, um, and then you ha it has the names of the four caliphs and then a Quranic uh, verse which refers to the, the, the presence and the mercy of the presence of the prophet on this earth. And so this is basically a standard text, which has been written by calligraphers throughout the centuries, which continues to be written by calligraphers uh, even today. Um, following this specific composition of the, the central circular, um, this, the, the circle in the center, the longer text in the bottom. And then this, uh, even this shape will find different um, variations. So for instance, another helio, which I did more recently is um, this one, which is actually a reproduction from another piece by Mahmoud Jalal al -Din. But um, in this piece, you see again, you, you have the, the circle you have the bottom part, but then you have uh, these two uh, trees in, on either side with the, the divine names, the 99 divine names, and then the 99 names of the prophet. So um, the Hilia is very interesting uh, in the sense that it, it does function a little bit like, a, like an icon in the Christian sense of the term. And I've put this uh, very interesting piece, which is now in the Turkish and Islamic Art Museum, um, where you see actually it is an icon that can open and close. And there were many very beautiful traditions related to the Hilie and how you would visit the Hilie or how these doors would be open on certain days of the Islamic calendar. Um, and these panels were attributed also, you know, talismanic qualities and it was considered that anybody who had a hilia in their home would be blessed and wouldn't be robbed or there wouldn't be any fires. Um, so it is for this reason that, uh, one of the reasons that uh, almost everyone in still today in Turkey, they, they want to have a hilia in their homes and they commission calligraphers to write this hilia, which is uh, a wonderful way to keep the tradition alive. 
um, and I think every calligrapher has written at least 40 hilias um, minimum. <laughs> it's basically one of the sort of constant um, uh, genres that we work on. Inspired by this concept of the Hilie, I, uh, I always felt very close to Seydna Mariam, to the Virgin Mary. So I worked on an icon, a calligraphic icon of the Virgin Mary, taking the verses that are in the Quran, uh, speaking about her. And then I was inspired by the Mihrab in the Cordoba Mosque in southern Spain. And then I added uh, the two divine names, which are in the two corners, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the most merciful. Um, uh, and now I'm just going blank. Um, anyway, you, everybody knows <laughs> the second part of the of the of the Basma now. So um, here you see the combination of the two styles, the Thuluth and the Nesik, which are often combined, the two styles that we studied together. And then we move on to other pieces, which we work on in a different way because they are done with a much larger kalam. Um, this is the, uh, the style, it's still the Thuluth style, Thuluth in, in Turkish, um, but we work with a larger kalam, so it, it becomes uh, much larger, much more difficult to manage, and we need to do much more, uh, many more adjustments at the end to make the letters look beautiful. So I'm showing you here, um, uh, whole uh, the process of how to do a final piece. Uh, the very rough uh, initial sketches. These sketches are actually after many many other uh, previous sketches. But you see how you you sort of build. So it's more. Uh, it's not only writing. It's also building and finding the most harmonious and the the, the best place to to place every single character and every single letter. So you see on the top right corner, you have the final piece. And then once you have the final composition, which again is always a, a large uh, jelly Thuluth piece, large Thuluth piece, then you can use the stencil to create multiple copies of the same piece. So you will still write it and still reproduce it, but you, all the work of making that perfect composition has already been done. And this is something very, very particular to the Ottoman school where you work on this refinement um, and polishing, polishing, polishing until you arrive to a final result. So I like to explain this because sometimes people, um, they think that we are inspired by, you know, the Chinese Eastern traditions where you basically breathe in and out and then, you know, you do one long stroke and there it is. But no, in, in this tradition, it's actually all about precision and, and really refining and working to find that, that, that perfect place. I mean, to the millimeter, to the hair width of every single um, element. This particular piece is actually um, the Ahl al-Bayt, the name of the family of the Prophet. So you have Muhammad in the bottom with the elongated uh, stroke. And then you have Fatima, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and then the name of God in the top. Another piece where you see this process of uh, creation. And in this piece, um, it's more recent from 2015. And you see the corrections of Daud Hoja, who was actually suggesting, you know, something as, as um, small as where you put the nokta, where you put the point of the letters. Uh, are you going to make the point round or square? Is it going to be higher or lower? Every single element will actually have an effect on the vision of the piece. And this is a, a very beautiful prophetic saying, Fatima Basata Minni, Fatima is a part of me. And so I wanted to have this feeling of, um, of intertwinement. And so you have the, the word for Fatima in the bottom, which is then intertwined and then minni, meaning up, uh, of me, at the very top. And again, these jelly Thuluth compositions can be very, very uh, complex. This is a piece that I worked on for about minimum eight months. 
making many, many, many sketches. And it was for a, an international competition and it finally won the second prize. Um, I was very happy <laughs> to have been able to produce this, uh, but it is really one of those pieces that this was, this is not the sort of piece that comes naturally. It's extremely, extremely, there's a lot of work that goes into these pieces where they're inside this apparent um, sort of, um, let's say, um, sort of easy harmony, it's actually extremely contrived, no? quote unquote. So you have to respect um, the reading order. So for instance, in this piece, you would start reading at the bottom, from the bottom to the left, from the bottom to uh, the top. Sometimes you go in another way. And there are many, many rules that in classical calligraphy that you have to, within this apparent liberty of moving things around, every act, everything actually needs to follow a certain reading order, structure, and um, aesthetic rules. And again, following this concept of the caliph, the, the model, you see the same piece, which I did later in a smaller size uh, in gold. Um, and we usually work with a very uh, old technique called the Zerendut, which is crushed gold, which is then used as paint. It's a crushed gold leaf. And this piece was beautifully illuminated by Abdul Hamid Yilmaz in Istanbul. And then from the, these very complex jelly fulu uh, compositions, there are other compositions which are actually extremely simple and which um, let's say that the inspiration comes much more naturally. So um, for instance, this noon, basically I just saw it. It just, I, I, I love the verse and, and I just, it just, kind of came into my mind. And it's a piece that I have written quite a few times because I, I, I love it so much. Um, the, the central composition took a little bit of work, but it, it, everything kind of flowed. <laughs> then other pieces like the one I showed you before, it's you know a question of months and, and really shaping and taking time. And the same uh, line of work is, is this piece, Ha, it's the letter Ha. And then in the middle, you have la ilaha, uh, la ilaha illahu, and there is no God by, but he with a capital H. And this piece uh, also was just a piece that came and um, I worked a little bit on the central part, but it was something that was very clear in my mind's eye before I was going to, to do it. Then I, I wanted to share with you, uh, this is what we call in Turkish a karalama, or meaning um, in, in Persian they say siyah mash, means to, to blacken the page. And this is what we do as calligraphers when we're practicing. And this has be also become a genre. So you, you will find pieces that are final pieces of karalamas that are signed and uh, extremely beautiful and, and astonishing pieces. Um, this was uh, a recent karalama that I did uh, inspired by the poem by Mansur al-Khalaj, which starts by saying, I saw my Lord with the eye of the heart and I asked him, who art thou? And he said, thou. And because of the nature of this poem, which is a very mystical poem, I, I chose this red background. Um, my teacher, Daud Bektaj, always says, that calligraphy is the art of the line and it is not an art of color. So out of respect for him and, and because I agree with, with these comments, I try not to use colored ink too much. I sometimes do, but it's the exception. I always try to use black ink, sometimes gold because um, it's also quite traditional and quite beautiful and noble. Um, so, in this case, I thought I need to have something because of this very mystical text. I should, you know, have something, you know, of color. And so I, I chose this red paper, which I was a bit worried about, but finally I, I, I was happy with the, with the result. And this is another piece also with red ink, uh, which is in this concept of the karalama or the mashk, 
in Arabic, um, but obviously more contrived. So there is a, a composition and there is a lot of method um, in this sort of exercise where you are writing the letters. And then if you can see the square dots, these are the measurements and the proportions of the letters. So this is what you do when you study, you are memorizing all these measurements of the letters. Um, but then when you do a final piece, all these measurements are in your mind and, and you, you don't actually write them out. In the Karalama genre of pieces, then you, you actually, you can do an analytical Karalama. I like to call them like this, um, where you do uh, indicate all these measurements and it adds a very beautiful texture from the visual point of view. And in the center of the piece, I put the Hua, which is the Chifta Hua, it's a mirror image of Hua, which means he. And uh, in the text, um, it's actually a very nice text. Uh, no human vision can encompass him, whereas he encompasses all human vision. For he alone is unfathomable, all aware. Um, it's from a Quranic verse. And so this question of vision and the circle and the hua in the center, for me, it was all related. So, um, and this piece is now in the home of a, a dear friend. And finally, this is another uh, piece which in, in this time of coronavirus seemed especially uh, pertinent. It is the verse of the throne, which we use um, in, in the, all over the Muslim world. This is a verse that is used uh, for talismanic purposes, for protection. And I had written it uh, followed by the verse that comes right after it. And the, the fee and gold, which uh, encircles uh, everything, comes right after the last word of a theme, of the last word of the, of the central part. And then you link it to the continuation of the verse. And also, I wanted to share this with you. I hope that I'm not really sure about time, but. Um, this was basically uh, another thing, I think one of the most important events uh, in which I have participated as a calligrapher, important for me personally, um, the, the Ministry of Culture of Dubai did a, an annual, um, sorry, did an, an annual uh, event for quite a few years, which just stopped last year, uh, where every Ramadan they would gather all calligraphers and they would ask each, third, not all calligraphers, 30 calligraphers, and they would ask each calligrapher to write one juice of the Quran. And this has been going on for quite a few years. So the first year they asked um, 30 calligraphers to write one juice. The Quran has 30 parts, 30 Jews. So they asked uh, each calligrapher to write one juice in the Nesik style. Another year they said Nesik and Thulut style. Another year, so every year you had a different style more or less the same group, sometimes with some variations. And so in this way, the Quran was handwritten on the traditional paper, uh, recto verso, in, during the month of Ramadan, which was, I thought, a very beautiful initiative because it is true that as calligraphers, we, it is very difficult to find a sponsor to write an entire Quran, for which basically you need to put aside a whole year or two years um, in order to just dedicate yourself to that. That is quite unusual. So for us to have this initiative was really beautiful. Um, I participated in 2017 for this uh, edition, which was writing Thuluth and then smaller Thuluth. And I wrote the Jews number 29. And it was really a, a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Very, very different from doing a final piece where you think more uh, almost as a painter in the sense of, uh, making a calligraphic image, which is going to be um, perceived mainly by its form and its text. But here you, you really go into the, the flow of the line and the, the rhythm of, of writing um, a longer text. And I, I do hope they will <laughs> restart uh, this initiative. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to finish with uh, a piece that I did 
for an online exhibit, Beauty and Solitude, which we organized during the, the quarantine of the coronavirus. This was a piece that I was working on um, with, um, uh, by myself, uh, for myself. Uh, it's a verse by Rumi, uh, things are revealed by their opposites. And I had never written Persian in uh, Thuluth in this uh, style. So for me, it was a real, uh, very beautiful opportunity. I, I was looking through Ottoman, a lot of Ottoman poems written in Thuluth because the Ottoman school, obviously this is the, the, the favorite, the, the sort of the predilect script of the Ottoman school. And so I decided if Ottoman Turkish is written in, in Thuluth, I should be able to write Persian in, in Thuluth as well. So, and there are examples of this. Uh, so I wrote this piece and it was a very, um, very special time, I'm sure for everyone um, during these weeks of confinement. Um, finally, I, what happens in calligraphy, I think for calligraphers, these weeks of confinement were not too difficult because we're very used to working in solitude. I mean, that is basically what we do. And I often tell students that um, if you want to be a calligrapher, you need to be sure, you need to be ready for that solitude. I mean, really you, you spend most of the time alone and then you will see your teacher and other students maybe once a week. Um, and my, and another master calligrapher, Bahman Panahi, who has worked a lot on the concept of music calligraphy, he works on music and calligraphy. He says something very interesting, which is that calligraphy is not like music or um, painting, which are very much based on emotion. No? So if you have emotion, you can express that through your music. If you have emotion, you can express that through your painting. Calligraphy basically is about having no emotion. Not that you don't have emotion, but I mean, suppressing it when you're writing. So you find a, a sort of a space in yourself where there is calmness, and stillness and you have to write from that place. If you cannot create that, that stillness in you, then it is very difficult. Sure, the, the column will give you trouble, the ink will give you trouble, the paper, those things happen the first years of calligraphy. But after some time, really, it is a question of what's happening inside yourself. And it doesn't mean that you master it, um, but you are aware of it and you do, uh, and it does become easier to when once when you get your kalam and you get your ink, automatically you you retreat into this place of uh, stillness, and that is how you are able to practice this art. Um, so um, that's how I I don't think I have anything else I wanted to add. I thought maybe if there are questions or there are a number of questions. So firstly, just thank you so much. It's just um, an absolute joy to listen to you. Um, I'm just full of admiration for your your skill and your artistry and your your tenacity and your perseverance. It's just wonderful, really staggering. Um, Thank you. So we have questions. Um, the, the, one of the very first comments was, um, I would like to learn calligraphy from you. And just building on that, I thought when you were speaking earlier about um, this chain of transmission and, and these very beautiful relationships you describe between this, you know, student and um, teacher, do you feel um, a responsibility to teach? And, and how do you balance that with um, exploring and developing your own practice? Yes, well, you know, I actually... Um... Yes, I, I think for, for calligraphy, you, you never go out looking for students. That's a little bit um, part of the adab, uh, the, the right comportment and the, the, the right conduct amongst calligraphers. You, you would never um, <laughs> go out saying, you know, you want to learn calligraphy. So you really do wait for students to come to you. And mm -hmm. that started happening to me after I received my ijaza. Um, my first one of my first student is a very dear student who is now a master uh, Khalid Casado he, he was also Spanish and it's been very very beautiful to see the way he has grown as a person as a calligrapher um, I taught him I had to teach him long distance because I wasn't living in Spain and then he continued in Istanbul as well and and we are always in touch and we continue to work together but 
um, that taught me a lot seeing his process. Uh, you realize uh, to the extent that as a teacher you are, you, you can make some sort of change, but a lot, a lot of happens <laughs> in the teaching um, mechanism, which is calligraphy doing its work because you, there's this curriculum and there's this way that has been transmitted throughout the centuries. And that kind of manages uh, what is happening with the student. Um, I do later, um, I, I, when I moved to Paris, especially I thought it was probably time I, I started teaching in sort of mainstream institutions. So I do teach at an institution in Paris and I have students that come um, once a week. I also give workshops, which is a new concept, which I wasn't very open to at the beginning because I thought, how can you do a workshop on calligraphy? You know, this is an art that you learn. <laughs> it took me seven years to receive my jaza. How, what can I do? You know, it's like saying, learn how to play the violin in seven days, you know? Mm -hmm. So in the West, especially, I have come to peace, uh, let's say, to doing workshops to make calligraphy known. That is the way mm -hmm. I see it and giving the tools, not in a superficial way. I, I try to do it in, a, in respecting the deepness and all the profound aspects of calligraphy, but uh, very conscious that these students are not going to become calligraphers. Maybe some will, I mean, maybe they will, but many of them won't, but maybe when they look at calligraphy, they will be able to appreciate it and they, they will be able to love it and, and relish it in the, in, in, in the way we do. So that for me is one of the priorities that I think we have no choice but to come out from. It's very comfortable for a calligrapher to just be at home with <laughs> at a table, glued to the table of calligraphy and we would never come out, you know? But, um, but I do think it is a responsibility to transmit and we learn this from our teachers. And Hassan mm -hmm. Chelebi is a wonderful example of this. Um, whatever happens, rain or shine, he's always there on his Saturday classes, even now that he has been um, a bit ill and unwell, and he's, he will still do his best, you know, a week after surgery, he's there visiting his students. And, and I think we, we take from that example of, um, we, we try to do, uh, you know, what we can, yeah. Oh, and, and the lovely comments um, coming through, um, your respect and dedication for your work is an inspiration. Thank you for such a wonderful talk. Um, the, uh, one of the, another one of the earlier questions was um, um, with the Jazza, is it unusual to have three um, masters on a single parchment at the same time in that way? Do you know of any other calligraphy? Yeah, yeah, there, there are many examples uh, of all the jazzes where we see uh, two signatures or three signatures. And the important thing is that uh, the masters all belong to the same line of transmission. So this is it, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have a, a master who has not studied with any of the other masters. So in this sense, we have uh, Hassan Chalevi, who's let's say the the grandfather figure, and then we have Mohamed Zakiria and Daoud Bektash who are in the same lineage. So, no, that, that is not unusual. That, that, ooh, my. Yes. Uh, the, another question following the same sort of theme, is there an injunction about attempting to learn multiple scripts at the same time? Yeah, so uh, this is a question of choice. Um, now, I, I have to say that in the modern world, um, the way it is, it's very difficult already to find time. Um, so mm. uh, it used to be that students would learn all the scripts, and I'm talking about Ottoman times, or at least a family of scripts. Um, but increasingly, we see people specialize, calligraphers specialize. So you, you, for instance, in my case, I specialize in Thuluth, and I also write Nesseh, but I consider Thuluth to be my main script. Um, and then you have other, or you will have calligraphers who will do like the first 20 years, they will just do Thuluth, Nesseh, Jelly Thuluth, mm -hmm. 
And then maybe after 20 years, I know I have some friend calligraphers who are doing that. They're now doing nastalik, you know, but I mean, after 20 years. <laughs> so you see, I mean, time is very, rel it's, it works differently in, in calligraphy times. I don't recommend people to start nastalik, thulut, nesik all at once because that will just be confusing. You usually do them uh, one after the other and you wait for each one to solidify. But again, there are different theories and you know, different teachers will have different opinions, but this is mostly what is being done in, in Turkey at the moment. And another, which is a little bit um, uh, more specific about materials, um, it's a question, of, um, why did you choose to write in crushed gold leaf as opposed to plain gold leaf? And there was another question <laughs> earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's it's the way I express myself, which wasn't correct. Meaning, you you take the gold leaf, which is uh, sold in booklets. You you take each leaf and you crush it, literally, or grind it. Maybe is the correct word in English. <laughs> and then from that, you create a sort of powder which you then mm. use with gelatin. And so you use it like a wash paint. So, mm. and this is the Zerendut technique. And some people uh, will just use like, a, a, let's say um, a mixture, which is a slightly uh, sticky. And then they will just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, transfer the gold leaf and, and, and then lift the gold leaf. But that is not as precise. You don't get the, the sort of precise edges at the end. Uh, and another, uh, an apology in advance for my pronunciation, could you please tell us about the direction of practice to learn the Thuluth cal uh, calligraphy in an effective way? <laughs> well, find a teacher, number one, uh, that's the, the most important thing. And then once you find your teacher, uh, do whatever the teacher tells you to do. <laughs> no, I mean, really. Um, jokes aside, I basically there is a very specific curriculum which uh, we all follow. So you ideally find a teacher who does follow a method and a curriculum, not his own method and curriculum, ideally a curriculum that has been tried over hundreds of years. And I always say, I know that the Ottoman Turkish method is a slow method, um, and mm. there are other methods out there which perhaps uh, go more quickly in other aspects, but then you will do, you will reach a block where you cannot go any further. Whereas the method uh, developed in the Ottoman school is a very, very, very effective um, to, because you're basically learning all the building blocks. You're learning the solfege, we say in French, you know, the, the musical notes um, slowly. And then once you know all the musical notes, then you can start composing together. Whereas um, mm. in, you know, if you just start, you know, diving into just copying compositions that leads you nowhere, because one of the very important things that sometimes people are not aware of is that as calligraphers, we're not copying, we mm. are creating. Um, they, there is this notion that a classical traditional calligrapher is just copying old works of art. And it's not the case. It's, it's very much, in France, I always use the, the, the analogy of the ballerina uh, of ballet, you know, you learn all the moves and then you will have all these different choreographies that you can do with these moves. So it's the same thing in calligraphy. You learn all the structure, all the elements, the harmony, the proportions, and then you try to create something which is new. Obviously mm -hmm. for the untrained eye, it may all look the same. The same way that someone will go to a ballet performance and say, this all looks the same. But for the trained eye, and again, we need to remember calligraphy is a noble art and it is not meant to be understood in its uh, minute detail by every single person. This is impossible. So it is a little bit, um, you know, you, when you're writing, you're, in a, you're almost writing for other calligraphers. Uh, but then obviously you hope that whatever you are doing will transmit beauty and harmony and to everyone, you know, but when it comes to the sort of the intricacies, um, then those are things that, that can be, you know, you need the expertise to be able to distinguish those aspects. Mm -hmm. 
when you were speaking, I, I, I was sort of aware of this idea of, you know, this, uh, you know, a deep connection to the past, yeah. balanced with, uh, you know, an almost unconscious ability to start to innovate and that sort mm -hmm. of tension between the two. Um, there is. Was fascinating. Yeah, 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 there is. And and now it's really interesting. You You have some excellent calligraphers who are doing a lot of explorations and what is actually interesting is that when you start looking not only at Ottoman calligraphy, but all the previous schools of calligraphy, I'm talking about the Timurid school of calligraphy, the you know, Sultanate India with the Bihari script, you know, the African manuscripts, Islamic calligraphy is so varied. I mean, you have 13th centuries of creations and there is almost an infinite source of uh, inspiration. So sometimes you see calligraphers doing some sort of new experiments, and then you see old pieces which were as uh, innovative and as uh, experimental, quote unquote. So that spirit of uh, experimentation has always been there. And that's why we have so many scripts because that's what they were doing. So there is that tension between the classical school and, and maintaining those forms and those canons, and at the same time, uh, being able to look for other uh, paths. However, you cannot look for new openings without having done all the legwork of the, you know, the classical training. And you can see that immediately. Somebody who's a calligrapher, a, a, a very well-trained calligrapher experimenting, then you see immediately they are respecting the principles. Maybe the letters are different. Maybe they're going, you know, they're, they're, they're mixing shapes or, or um, deforming certain letters, but they know exactly why they're mm. doing that. Whereas somebody with zero training, um, the result is completely, at least for the calligrapher side, we can immediately see that there is a, something which is not yeah. as harmonious. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can see from these questions coming in that you're clearly inspiring many people um, and just to sort of group together I want so we have um, what level of Arabic should one know to begin to take up the calli um, calligraphic tradition and do you think children say 12 years old can start to learn calligraphy? Hmm. Yeah the children question is a difficult one well uh, first of all for the Arabic um, I myself I have a intermediate level of Arabic so, but I do know how to read it and write it. And I know the basic grammar structure and so on. So it does help to know, uh, especially once you become a professional calligrapher, you need to have some knowledge. You don't have to talk fluently. I, I don't speak fluently uh, Arabic, but you do need to have some knowledge. However, that can, I mean, because calligraphy takes so long, um, I always tell my, my beginner students, they don't need to know Arabic because they're learning the letters, they're learning the strokes, they're learning the shapes. So, you know, they're going through the alphabet. So they're learning how to read and write as they are learning calligraphy, um, you know, so in, in that sense. And, and I have, uh, there are many examples of very good calligraphers who are not uh, fluent in Arabic. So it's, it's not a condition. It can definitely help, but it's not a condition. And um, we need to remember that in the Arab world, uh, you know, only 10% are native Arab speakers, and there were so many uh, great calligraphers in different areas. Um, yeah. Oh, and then for the, stu for the children, sorry, the, regarding yeah. children, uh, traditionally, yes, uh, children started very young. Um, but I, I, I do have, for instance, one student who's 13 years old, and when the mother <laughs> called me, uh, to ask me if she could be the student. I said, is it you who wants to, for your daughter to study calligraphy or is your daughter? Because finally it all comes down to your love of the art. And the Turks say very beautifully, Ashk olmadan meshk olmaz. Without love, there is no meshk. Without love, there is no lesson. So if you don't have this love coming from you, not from <laughs> your parents, you know, then it won't really... But, you know, it is, it is good to expose children uh, to calligraphy uh, at different levels. And then if they want to pursue it more seriously, then they should be the ones taking, making the steps and, you know, doing the, uh, trying to, to move forward. Yeah. In, in a very sort of um, 
delicate way. Certainly with the Institute, we have explored um, calligraphy workshops for children at the museum, but very much in that, uh, you know, with that sort of notion of, you know, just raising awareness and sharing something exactly. beautiful rather. Exactly, which I think is also extremely important because you never know the seed that you plant, what's going to happen 10 years down the road. So I, I think all of those things um, are extremely important. Yeah. Um, I, I realize that we are running over time now and there are so many absolutely fascinating questions here. So I think what, what we might do maybe is draw them all together and maybe we can find a way of... Um, answering them as a, as a follow-up to your talk we can maybe right. post some post because um, some of them are actually um uh, very nuanced and complex as well so <laughs> are, you happy to, are you happy to 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 stop now noria yes 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 all right but so again just a sincere thanks um, from the Institute and from Leighton House. It's just been an absolutely wonderful um, privilege to hear you speak. Yes, thank you very much for, for hosting and, and for organizing this. And it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you.